Dan with me, uh, follow each other on Twitter. We talk a lot about technology and uh, we have done a stream in the past. We have one today and one day after tomorrow on the uh, composition, cross-plane composition deep dive. Uh, so, uh, I mean, Dan has been doing amazing stuff, as you all know, uh, in the community, you know, writing some deep technical uh, blogs. Uh, so he's one of those person who actually goes into deep dive uh understanding a concept and then basically how things work and then he tries to explain that in a fashion like everybody likes to read so i think that's that's pretty cool i really enjoy reading dan uh, dan's articles and uh, his risk five tips whatever what the topic is today so uh, today we'll be learning about risk five uh, it's a kind of introductory stream it an introduction to me and to you so it's only dan shows today uh so he'll be you know uh walking us through what it is how you can get involved if you are a beginner and you know if you ever thought uh, you know i want to get into risk five it kind of seems intimidating then it's not that much so uh he will be you know explaining all those stuff uh he has he has Try to ke uh, kept it, you know, pretty basic. All the compilers and the stuff, um, all the things that he got stuck at, and you know, you can uh, find a way uh, to do that. I see people have joining in, so hi everyone. Um, who those who are joining in, thank you so much for tuning in. Um, uh, that I mean, I always like people joining live and asking questions. And today is actually a very special stream because Risk Five is not that much, you know um explored i would say or very much talked about in the cloud native industry uh this is kind of a separate ecosystem separate foundation uh it has you know a, a lot of stuff just like cncf there is a risk five international foundation so there are a lot of stuff which are uh there uh and kim who was uh the uh, one of the uh, uh one of the person um you know running in the cncf is now uh working uh for the risk five and uh, i think it's it's pretty interesting uh so that, you know uh, to to learn about it and i'm pretty excited about uh, today's session and i hope uh, all of you are as well equally and uh, we all know like you know dan is awesome so uh, you should have high hopes from the session as well so <laughs> i'm setting the stage on fire already uh, so, so welcome dan and thank you so much for spending time again and uh, he he's he's pretty awesome human being uh, as well as a technologist because you know he never says no uh, i don't know especially to me he never says so i i'm very fine with that uh, so uh, dan please introduce yourself uh, to the community yeah absolutely well first of all thanks for having me on i'm definitely honored to be on the stream um talking about you know folks that uh, uh, contribute a lot to the community and produce a lot of content and that sort of thing. Uh, you're definitely top of the list there. So uh, it's an honor to be on the stream for sure. Um, as you mentioned, uh, I've I've done um, a fair amount of things in kind of the cloud native space. That's, uh, I guess, the uh, space I operate in kind of for my, my day job, if you will, um, which primarily consists of uh, being a maintainer of the Crossplane project. Uh, which is uh, built on top of Kubernetes and basically allows you to build uh, what we call a control plane uh, on top of that, uh, which allows you to kind of design your own Heroku, we like to say, uh, which is uh, get these kind of cloud provider APIs and compose them into higher level abstractions and then present those uh, to developers. And uh, as Siam said uh, on Friday, we're actually going to talk about that a little bit more. Um, so I'm excited for that. Uh, today, though, uh, we are talking about Risk Five, uh, which may be something that folks are familiar with or are not. Um, you know, it really, uh, from a cloud native perspective, uh, doesn't actually really need to come come up, right? It's it's a uh, what's underlying things, right? So um, I thought maybe we'd start off here by just um, kind of thinking about what an instruction set architecture is, and maybe trying to relate that. Uh, to how it, it could be important for for someone who you know is just kind of at the the software level. Um, so, Siam, I, I actually thought I'd, I'd start off and uh, ask you kind of like when you hear the term um, instruction set architecture, which uh, folks you'll usually see that abbreviated to ISA. What kind of like comes to mind to you? So it comes like I do not want to go into that domain. I do not want to kind of, you know, explore that. And that is uh, something which is there. And I, I'll just uh, be in, in my cloud native world. Yeah, yeah. I think I think a lot of folks are like that. Um, and, and, you know, the first thing I'd say is you, 
you really don't need to go into it, right? So, so uh, it, I think it would be a failure of our software stacks, right? If everyone had to understand um, the instruction set they were interacting with. Um, and, and so that's certainly not a requirement. So I definitely don't want anyone to walk away from this saying, oh, I don't know about RISC-V or I don't wanna learn about that. So I, I can't do other things in software. That's certainly not the case. Um, however, one of the things that's kind of become apparent to me is, is you know, I operated mostly um, in the software space for so far in my, my relatively short career, I'd say. Um, and, you know, I studied computer science and that sort of thing. Uh, and I certainly uh, felt like hardware was kind of like a whole different realm, right? That was kind of like outside of my expertise. That was a bit opaque. Um, and so, you know, something I want to do uh, is I've kind of like uh, become very passionate about um, hardware and specifically about the RISC-V instruction set architecture uh, is make that uh, accessible for other folks who want to learn about it, if you want to, right? You don't have to, um, but it's available. And that's one of the revolutionaries. That's probably the biggest, uh, you know, thing about RISC-V uh, that's really important is that it is available for everyone. So maybe if we kind of uh, take a step back and think about uh, what an instruction set architecture is and what ones exist now and which ones you, you frequently interact with. So um, an instruction set architecture is essentially uh, the, the lowest level of instructions that you can give to a computer. So if you are, you know, writing Go or Python or Java or what, whatever your, your language of choice is, what you're really doing is you're instructing the computer to perform some tasks, right? Um, what a compiler does is it takes that information and it compiles it down, you know, eventually to ones and zeros. Now, uh, compilers need to be able to target uh, different types of machines. Uh, you probably are familiar with, and you're probably using an x86 machine to watch this st uh, stream right now. Um, so that is an instruction set architecture. You've probably also heard of ARM. Maybe you have a Raspberry Pi that runs ARM. Maybe you have uh, a phone that has an ARM processor in it. Um, that's also an instruction set architecture. So basically it's the, the lowest level vocabulary that your high level language gets translated into to be able to communicate um, with with the, the hardware. So, uh, you know, I've alluded to these two primary instruction sets and, and they're actually really uh, illustrative of kind of the differences between instruction sets. So um, x86 uh, pioneered by Intel um, and, and also now uh, produced by AMD as well uh, is uh, a completely proprietary. Um, it's locked down to those two vendors. Um, you obviously are able to observe the instructions that are available in x86 or else you wouldn't be able to interact with the machines. But um, for instance, you can't go and create an x86 processor, right? Um, that is proprietary technology. You're not allowed to do that. ARM, on the other hand, uh, is a little bit different uh, in that they actually license their uh, various uh, instruction set architectures to companies. So, you know, namely, you're probably familiar with recently, Apple has been producing M1 chips, right? That are, that are ARM processors. Um, and Apple pays ARM uh, quite a bit of money to actually uh, be able to do that. So um, that's kind of the, the two major instruction sets right now. Um, and, and there's another difference between those two, actually, that's really important uh, and something that's kind of obvious from the name of RISC-V. Uh, x86 is what's referred to as a CISC architecture, um, and ARM and RISC-V are what's referred to as a RISC architecture. So I've already seen uh, someone in the chat um, mention uh, uh, that RISC stands for Reduced Instruction Set Computer. Um, and similarly, CISC stands for Complex Instruction Set Computer. Now, this is not a, a revolutionary new thing. And actually, one of the things we'll look at here in just a moment is kind of uh, the uh, genealogy, they say, of the uh, instructions in the RISC-V instruction set. Um, but back in the 80s, um, David Patterson and, and John Hennessy, who are professors at Berkeley and Stanford, I believe, um, uh, kind of... Uh, we're, we're pioneering this idea of a re reduced instruction set computer. So the difference here is you can imagine that lowest level vocabulary that you use to talk to the computer uh, can either be uh, a small set of words that you can say. Um, so for instance, let's say if uh, Siam was going to uh, tell me to do some things, I could say, uh, you know, you either have four instructions, you could say, um, 
you know, jump, run, go here, something like that, you know, a very limited set of operations. And Siam could take those operations and combine them together to actually have me do pretty complex tasks, right? Um, on the other hand, so that so that would be an example of a reduced instruction set, right? I have a limited number of operations I can perform, um, and they're all very simple, um, but uh, they can be combined together to do more complex things. Uh, complex instruction set, on the other hand, is if I had a single command that uh, Siam could say, like, groceries, and that meant, you know, I had to uh, stand up like go to my car, get in my car, drive to the grocery store, buy the groceries, bring them home, put it in the refrigerator. Um, but that was all a, a, stringle, a single instruction. Um, but behind that, right, is a lot of actual work that I would have to do. Now, the general sentiment kind of, uh, I think, through uh, the development of x86 and, and um, general complex instruction sets uh, was that it was easier for software developers if you exposed more complex instructions. So continuing with this kind of analogy that we have right now, uh, Siam is, is the software engineer, right? And, and I'm the hardware. Uh, and so it's, it seems like it'd be a lot easier for Siam to say, um, I, uh, uh, you know, groceries, go get the groceries. That seems a lot easier than telling me each of the individual things. And, and on the face, it would. That being said, that's really hiding a bunch of complexity, right? So, uh, you know, thinking of a compiler engineer, if you're trying to expose uh, a general purpose language, a general purpose higher level language, so let's say Go, for instance, um, it's actually pretty hard to have a ton of different, very specific operations that mask a bunch of work that happens behind the scenes. Um, and uh, a computer, right, uh, the, the general kind of way it executes things is it fetches an instruction uh, from memory and then it executes it, right? And then it, it fetches the next one, executes it, et cetera. Um, and so it, it, there's some overhead in fetching an instruction. So you can imagine if we have one instruction like groceries uh, that can do a lot of things, you'd think, you know, if we fetch that from memory, if we only have to fetch that one instruction, that's reducing our overhead a lot. However, uh, there's a trade-off that happens here, right? There's, there's an equation. You can say, Yes, there is less overhead in fetching instructions, but that one instruction has, uh, you know, takes a lot of cycles, the CPU cycles to be able to run. Um, and so if you can actually make the relative cost of each of those instructions uh, much less, then it can make it easier, actually, and you can pr have more efficient computing uh, if you fetch more instructions, but that are less expensive. Um, so that was kind of like the big argument that was happening at that time. Uh, it was definitely looked down upon, but uh, as we've seen like folks moving towards ARM, you've probably seen things about like Graviton processors on AWS. Um, you can actually get some real performance gains um, and they can be more energy efficient, which is why, for instance, ARM processors are, are used in phones, right? Uh, because you have to be really energy efficient. You don't have a power source connected all the time. So anyway, uh, that is kind of the background uh, about that. Um, we definitely want to uh, move into Risk Five here and actually talk about that a little bit more. But Siam, you know, when I was going through that, was there anything that kind of like came to mind or any questions that you'd have? Uh, no, I think uh, that that explains pretty well uh, how like you know what what exactly is the instruction set, uh, and uh, we as like we use the compiler. So basically, these are the instructions that the instruction set is going through with respect to the different architectures like x86, the ARM processors, and then they uh, do it in in terms of you know the the risk and the uh, CISC. So where the CISC kind of is the complex uh stuff that that it kind of does uh the hardware instruction set and the reduced ones there are specific stuffs which are there and we have to combine those and create a, a complete a, you know a, a task uh maybe whatever terminology it is i'm not sure but calling it a task mm -hmm. and yeah, you, have a, you have a comment already like nice nicely explained <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm I'm glad you think so. I'm sure uh, it'd be easier with some visuals, which we'll we'll get to uh, in a moment. Um, but uh, yeah, actually, let me let me go ahead and just share my screen and let's start jumping sure. into things. Uh, definitely, folks, keep questions coming. Uh, you know, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, I'm I'm certainly not a uh, an expert in this. Um, I'm more of a uh, a a big enthusiast, I guess you'd say. Um, and so uh, I'll do my best to answer them, but also point you to places where. Uh, you can find them yourself. 
So let's go ahead and share this. All right. So here, uh, Siam was mentioning there is a uh, RISC V foundation. Um, so it's actually underneath the Linux foundation, just like the CNCF. Um, so you could uh, consider them kind of sibling organizations. Um, and there's actually some effort to do some kind of like cross pollination there. Um, and, and also RISC V Summit is coming up in San Francisco, um, which is uh, worth mentioning. I believe everything will also uh, be virtual. So if you want to tune in like that, um, that sounds good. Uh, I did want to mention if you're interested in kind of the uh, crossover um, between uh, Cloud Native and RISC V, let's see if I can find it here. Uh, I'll be giving a talk on open hardware for the open cloud. Um, and so if you're interested in that, uh, definitely feel free to come by um, and, uh, and, and go through that with me. Um, but I want to spend some time talking about what it actually means to define an instruction set, right? Um, an instruction set itself is not any hardware or software or anything like that, right? It's a specification. Um, so you might be familiar with uh, the Kubernetes API as a specification, right? Um, an implementation of that API is the Kubernetes API server, um, but that API actually exists outside of that, and you could actually implement your own API server. Um, and so RISC-V is, is really just a, a set of specifications. And uh, if you want to uh, actually go ahead and look at those, I know where they have it uh, on here. If you go to specifications, and we're going to look at them actually here, um, the ISA specification is the uh, main uh, the main thing that you would look at. And this is specified in an unprivileged spec and a privileged spec. We'll talk about what the difference between those uh, mean. There's also some other specs that uh, are in progress right now. Um, I'm particularly interested in the debug spec. That's uh, the primary place where I've uh, been involved in actually contributing in the RISC-V community. Um, so we can talk about that uh, a little bit too. But uh, when you think about uh, what hardware provides, right? Um, there, there's a few different things that have to exist below the uh, the software level. Um, particularly one that you might be interested in is this concept of user space, right? Um, so when you run a program on your computer, uh, you are typically executing in user space. And uh, what's happening behind the scenes, right, is your operating system is scheduling uh, those operations um, to compute on, on your machine, right? Uh, and that op and your operating system is what allows you to do multiple things at the same time. Um, in RISC-V, uh, we have a, a few different uh, modes, right? So, so for software to be able to take advantage of isolation and protection uh, in terms of privilege levels, um, you have to be able to, you know, enable that at the hardware level. So I'm actually just going to uh, pull open a uh, Excalibur draw here, uh, which is just a, a diagramming software I like to use. And let's actually just walk through um, what it kind of looks like, right? So let's say this is your computing environment. Um, in RISC-V, we have the option to specify uh, up to three different privilege levels, uh, and actually uh, a fourth one if you count the debug spec that we'll talk about. So at the bottom level here, we have what's called machine mode. Machine mode means that you have basically full access to the hardware, right? Um, you you have the most privilege you can have um, in in the machine, uh, and so you obviously don't want to run most software there because that means if you were running, let's say Chrome on your desktop, right? You're running your browser, um, and that crashed, it would take down the whole system. So we definitely don't want to do that. Um, we actually don't even want to run our operating system at the uh, machine mode level. Uh, because that's not that's more privilege than we want to use, um, and uh, you you don't need uh, that level of access uh, from from the operating system. Uh, so the kind of middle level that we talk about there uh, is supervisor mode, and you'll see these abbrevi abbreviated as M S, and then finally uh, user mode, uh, which is where you operate in when you log into your laptop or something like that, or you log into a server. Uh, you're operating in user mode and kind of you're being presented this interface by your operating system that is running at uh, supervisor mode. Now, uh, you're probably familiar with uh, something like a syscall, right? Um, so let's say when we write a, 
let's actually just go ahead and write one uh, for fun. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and open this up. And I just have some, some demo programs we'll get to in a bit here. Um, but let's go ahead and close those out. And I'm just going to write a simple Go program. So we'll say main.go. And we'll create our main function. And we'll just print hello world. All right. So this seems pretty straightforward, right? Uh, just about the most simple program you could write. Um, behind the scenes, there's actually quite a lot of stuff uh, happening here. So if we go and uh, let's go into our simple go and go run main.go, we print hello world. Now, to actually be able to print hello world, right, our, our program has to be able to talk to the hardware uh, and specify that we want to print to this output device, right? Um, and so how does it do that? If we're in user mode, we don't have access to the hardware. So essentially what we do is we ask, um, we ask the operating system to perform an operation for us. And that's where you'll hear about uh, syscalls. So uh, if we look over, let's say like post-it syscalls, and see uh, a list of a, yeah, a list of uh, syscalls that you're probably familiar with. Um, so something like uh, changing the root directory, which is something you might be familiar with if you've used containers at kind of a lower level. Um, something like changing the permissions to a file, um, various random things, um, get the host name, et cetera. Um, and so when you actually uh, need to uh, print something to the screen, uh, you're actually making a syscall here. So this program, when it runs, is basically saying that I need supervisor mode to perform an operation for me. And supervisor mode can say, uh, I'll do that, right? And then I want to return back to user mode. Um, and so uh, in this case, after we execute this, if we then wanted to say, uh, let's say a you know, equals two plus two or something like that. Um, it's obviously not going to work because we don't use that variable. Um, but if we just did something like that, um, right, we're no longer having to go into user space. So after we perform this uh, operation that we have to ask the operating system to do for us, uh, it returns back to user space and you continue executing with things you can do there. So the point I'm trying to get at, right, is that we have these privilege levels that are defined in our hardware and our software either enables or disables them and also specifies how we can move between them. So when we talk about user mode, that's where we're talking about our unprivileged specification, right? These are these are operations that do not require privilege access to the hardware. Um, and that's where you'll see general instructions defined, right? So when things get um, compiled down, um, let's do a go build main.go. And we have our main here. And I believe if we wanted to do a object dump of main, we're going to get a lot of stuff. You'll see that we're compiled down right to all these different instructions that are being performed. Uh, and since I'm running on an x86 machine, right, this is uh, going to give me x86 instructions. Once again, a complex uh, instruction set. Um, and so if we actually looked here, we could probably uh, look at where we're actually performing. Here we go. Uh, calling format uh, print LN here. That's where we're making our, our call. So if we wanted to I'm actually pipe this into less here and see if we can find what was the Uh, dump this again and see if I can get the exact call we made. All right. Uh, F print LN, just the capital F. Oops. Then less. If we can find it. All right. So here's where we're actually calling it. Um, and there's a variety of things happening here, but essentially, uh, what happens is we eventually make a system call um, and and then we return. 
So getting back over here in the unprivileged spec, all the things that we do that are not uh, that system call that are just things that that happen are defined in uh, in our unprivileged specification, right? These are just operations that can happen. We can store things, we can access memory, uh, actually virtual memory um, in user space, um, and we can perform operations and do computation that doesn't require privilege access uh, to the hardware. Uh, once again, these are these are x86 instructions, so we're not looking at, at RISC-V yet. But um, let's go ahead and actually open up the specification. I've got it here on my, my local desktop. And we can go into the RISC-V spec. Let me pull that up here. All right. Um, so it's uh, fairly extensive. Uh, but one of the things that kind of was uh, a bit of a breakthrough for me, right, is that you can actually just go read this. Um, and one of the things that's different besides, you know, like ARM or x86 or something like that, uh, is that you can also go see an implementation. So uh, if you are not familiar, this may be a, a look a little bit complex, but you can definitely understand um, uh, an implementation of a processor here. So um, I think that I actually had a list here. Let me see. Maybe I don't have it up, but let's look at RISC-V cores here. So this is an archived uh, repository, but these are all implementations that are just on GitHub um, that you can go and actually look at. Um, a good example that I like is uh, Pico RV2 32 here. Um, and this is actually just a RISC-V core here defined in Verilog. Um, so you could go through here and actually see how various things defined in the interface are, are implemented in a hardware definition language. And this is this was a big breakthrough for me, right? Because previously I could see the interface to interact with hardware, but now I can see how the actual hardware is implemented. And another great thing about the RISC-V spec is uh, when you go through here, uh, you'll see these little notes um, throughout the uh, specification that give some pretty uh, good um, uh, kind of background on why certain decisions were made and how it and how it influences both how software is written and how hardware is implemented. So you can really get a, a nice uh, view of that. So in this um, in this unprivileged spec, we're going to get a few different kind of top level um, uh, ISA specifications. Um, so you'll see here RV32i, RV32e, RV64i, and RV128i. Um, essentially, these are 32-bit, 64-bit, and 128-bit uh, architecture specifications. Um, so RISC-V supports all of those. And these, um, the extension here is specifying the, uh, or the, the letter here afterwards is specifying uh, what extensions are specified. So um, a, another big part of RISC-V is that it uses this extension mechanism. You'll see all of these listed here actually in the spec. Um, and this extension mechanism see, uh, makes it such that you can actually define um, hardware that, uh, that you know, has the capabilities you need without adding a bunch that you don't. So when you look at uh, the supported instruction set on a given machine, it may support you know, any number of these extensions, the base just being the integer instruction set. Um, and you can see that we define our registers here, um, but overall the specification is pretty small, right? We don't have too much here for just the base instruction set um, for the integer extension uh, or the integer core, you might say. Um, and and so it's pretty simple. That being said, uh, most computers need a lot more than just integer instructions. Um, they might need things like control and status registers, which we'll talk about in a minute. A minute. They'll likely need floating point operations, right? Um, to be able to do most of the things uh, that we do on modern computers these days. Um, let's see, compressed instructions, for instance, are the ability to uh, take a, a longer instruction, compress it down to a smaller format, which we can look at in a bit. Um, and then things like SIMD, um, single instruction, multiple data path uh, instructions are things that allow us to take advantage of parallelism uh, in the hardware. Uh, and, and so there's all these different extensions. And uh, what I'm getting to with that is that typically when you actually interact with, you know, compiling something on your local machine, is that you're going to be using RV64 uh, GC usually. Uh, and G stands for general, okay? 
So general is basically saying uh, that you can see here, we actually have the G ones here. Um, and I don't know. Yeah, here we have it listed. It's saying the these extensions are all enabled. Um, so this is kind of like the basic operations you'd expect for a computer. Um, and so when we look at uh, RV64G, uh, we have uh, the integer, which is the base. Um, we have M, which uh, is uh, integer multiplication and division. We have uh, the atomic instructions, uh, the floating point. Uh, D is escaping me right now. Um, and then we also have uh, control and status registers and fence uh, instructions, which are used uh, for uh, memory consistency. So lots of stuff there. But all that to say is typically you're going to be using this kind of like general purpose uh, set of instructions. So taking taking a pause here um, and thinking about kind of like the unprivileged and privileged, uh, are there any questions that come up there, uh, Siam? Uh, yeah. Um, first of all, like, can you point to the link of the repository where we can see the implementation? Because I think that makes sense. Um, like you can see the specification, you can see the interfaces, and you can see the actual implementation that is implemented on the hardware. Mm -hmm. So I think that's uh, that's pretty interesting. And it it actually, uh, you know, uh, relates, you know, uh, this is how it should be done. And this is how it actually happens. So that that uh, makes much more sense. And that gives a lot more uh, understanding, to be honest, mm -hmm. um, with respect to that. So I'm pasting that link in the chat. And uh, the modes look nice, like um, uh, nobody would have imagined, you know, the Hello World uh, Go program looks like this uh, under the behind the scenes from the hardware point of view. Uh, so that is pretty interesting with a bunch of instructions. Uh, so when you say like uh, you 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 said one thing, like these are the x86 instructions and not the risk five instructions. Mm -hmm. So that means uh, the x. Uh, so this particular architecture, uh, they have not. Uh, they are not they are not adhering to the risk 5 specifications right right so we're, we're uh the go compiler is going to use your native machines um uh, architecture by default um but it actually go actually makes cross compilation super easily um so let me double check what the uh the um specific or the the name is for what they call uh let's see architectures um, so it looks like we have the list here. Um, so I can show actually, this might be dated, so I don't think they have risk five listed here. Oh yeah, they do. Okay. So uh, we can actually specify, uh, risk five, uh, 64 here. Um, and let's show what that looks like. We can actually let's go ahead and remove our, our main there and I'll do, uh, go arch equals risk five. 64 go build main.go and so we get our main binary there again and if i want to actually look at the contents of that um yeah, object dump main uh let's see it may not be able to disassemble this but we could actually just use let's try um and i'll specify how to get this in a moment work for us uh yeah there we go so i'm just using uh the regular object dumped instead of the go one um and obviously there's a lot here um let's actually do this into less so we can actually look at some stuff so here we're actually looking at uh risk five instructions right um and so go actually has great support out of the box for for compiling for different architectures um and so uh, you'll see here that these instructions look pretty different actually than the x86 ones we were looking at earlier um but one thing that you'll notice even by just scrolling through this uh is that you don't see a lot of different instructions right these all are like you're seeing uh store double word over and over again um, you're seeing add upper immediate program counter over and over again. You're seeing jump and jump and link register over and over again. Uh, the reason why you're seeing that, right, is because there's a limited number of instructions here, right? This is a reduced instruction set. Um, and so there's not, uh, you know, a ton of different things there. Uh, but we perform the same operations, essentially, um, uh, just using, you know, different different commands here. All right. Um, 
any other questions about uh, maybe what uh, is encompassed and uh, in the uh, unprivileged architecture um, and, uh, and as well as kind of like the extension mechanisms or do, do you have any questions maybe about um, when you might want to uh, not have support for, for some of the extensions? Yeah, uh, so basically you said there are three modes, right? The user, uh, sup supervisor, and the machine mode. Uh, so irrespective of the architecture, these modes are there. Like not, not only RISC-V, but they, they are there in, in the current machine that you're running as well. So when you, uh, is that true? Or is it only yeah. like... Yeah, I, I, so on my machine right now, I do have uh, multiple levels of privilege. Uh, this is an uh, an x86 machine, um, so it'd be uh, under that specification. Uh, with RISC-V specifically, um, and we can actually go ahead and open this up just to take a look uh, in the privilege spec here. I've already zoomed in on this one, it looks like. Um, let me go over to privilege levels. So it specifies them here. I think there's a diagram, uh, but... There may not be a great, oh, here we go. So this is pretty good. Um, talking about kind of some of the uh, the different uh, stacks you could have. Uh, you actually, the minimum for a RISC-V machine is just machine mode, right? You could say everything operates at the most privilege. So if you had like a little embedded controller or something like that, maybe you would only implement machine mode. And that removes a whole set of uh, complexity that would have to be in the, the processor design. Um, by just saying, you know, everything runs in machine mode. Uh, it's also frequent that you'll have um, uh, just machine mode and user mode. So you have two different levels of privilege. Um, that makes a lot of sense, once again, in maybe some embedded device where you want some memory protection. Um, and we'll talk about how, how memory protection looks a little bit. Um, but you, you want some memory protection, but you really only have one process that's running, right? So you might have um, something like a real-time operating system or, or something like that. Yep, I think that's that's pretty interesting. Yeah, like uh, for the small devices, I believe if they you know want to have the Risk Five uh, architecture at the hardware level, then only the machine mode makes sense because that it is limited to certain it performs certain set of functions. So I think uh, that that particular mode uh, makes sense uh, for the small devices. And um, uh, yeah, I think. Uh, Whatever you said uh, uh, is is getting to our head, so I think that's 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 good. And the instruction seems are very complex. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I just saw that that comment. Um, I I wanted to point out, not to uh, to point at my own stuff, but um, one of the things that I've been trying to do is create some real small um, posts that are just about kind of uh, getting into um, different parts of the instruction set. So this first one here. Um, which I'll go ahead and, and drop here for us to put in the chat, um, is telling you how you can get uh, your GNU um, tool chain for uh, all these different tools uh, for RISC five. So um, unlike the Go compiler, right, uh, for this tool chain, you actually need separate binaries to be able to cross compile. Um, and then we'll also look at using QMU for being able to emulate running these, right? Because this is a uh, uh, this is not built for the architecture that I'm on. Um, and so we'll we'll talk about how you can simulate that on on the architecture you do have. Um, and then in some of these other posts, we'll actually get more into uh, these various instructions and instruction formats. Um, so you'll see uh, there's a variety of instructions, right? We saw those in the output of our binary there. Um, and they all fall into different instruction formats. So you can actually take the uh, the binary representation of these uh, instructions and understand what they're doing by putting them into their uh, various classification um, and and then kind of like extracting the different arguments, right? Because eventually this all has to come down to to bits, right? That are that are interpreted, interpreted by um, the processor. Um, and so let's actually take a look maybe at one of these uh, instructions. Mm -hmm. So let me go down. And we're looking at our format here. Um, and so uh, the um, add word instruction uh, fits in the R format, right? So uh, in this case, I've, I've taken this and expanded um, the, the binary representation of add uh, W here. 
Um, and if we look at that and fit it into the R format, you can see that we have these different fields where we're specifying to the computer uh, what needs to be performed. So for instance, the opcode and the funct fields uh, tell it basically uh, what operation to perform. And then just like, you know, if you were writing a function, right, that took arguments, that's really what these instructions are doing as well, right? We have these RS1, RS2, and RD uh, fields here, uh, which I actually talk about uh, a little more in depth. Um, but for instance, in add, uh, we've specified that we want to use the add instruction to the uh, computer. And uh, then we've also specified, let's see, uh, I don't think I copied it down here. Oh yeah, so uh, in we want to add uh, the contents of uh, A0. Um, let's see, we want to, sorry, we want to add uh, A0 and A1 and store it in uh, A0. And so uh, we're essentially performing that operation by passing arguments, right, in the form of registers um, in your CPU uh, to the computer. And it actually performs that that binary addition for us there. So that's just an example of how one instruction works, right? But the important thing to note is whenever you compile something down, right, it's becoming binary, right, that eventually gets uh, interpreted uh, by the computer. And these instructions are just one level above the binary, right, and helping us understand uh, what instructions we want to give to the computer. All right. So... I want to uh, look a little bit at the privilege spec because whenever you start up a machine, you're actually starting in machine mode, right? D despite what the uh, other privilege levels are. And you essentially need to tell the machine to uh, go to a different privilege level. And also uh, when uh, something like a syscall is performed, um, which is uh, done via the uh, e-call instruction in RIS-5, uh, how we actually handle that. So you probably heard the term uh, uh, trap or exception or interrupt or those sorts of things. Those are all things that uh, cause us to move between privilege levels on the computer. So when we make a syscall um, in RISC-V vernacular, that would be an exception. Um, and that exception is handled by, uh, by a trap handler that we specified. So for instance, the Linux kernel uh, is going to register uh, trap handlers to be able to, um, you know, process different uh, exceptions that happen. Uh, so a syscall is a great example of that, where we basically uh, calls a trap in the higher privilege level. So from the um, from user mode, we're causing a trap, and based on what we've set the uh, trap handler to be, uh, that trap handler is basically going to execute code uh, in supervisor mode to perform whatever the syscall we passed is. Um, and so when you come into machine mode, you actually have to get to supervisor mode. And then in supervisor mode, right, you you run things uh, in user mode. So let's take a look at some of the different things that you may set uh, in machine mode. So an important thing to note is uh, the existence of uh, control and status registers. Now, when you're executing a program, you have a limited set of registers, right? Um, and we'll see those definitely in our output here, um, like A3, SP, these are all registers. Um, if we want to look at uh, a list of RISC-V registers, I believe I have it in this post here. Here's the full list of, of registers that we have. Registers are kind of the fastest level of memory you can imagine. So in a computer, you have a, a sequence of memory uh, in a hierarchy, right? Um, and so uh, registers are the first thing, right? That's what the processor actually directs, uh, interacts with directly. And then next, you usually have uh, some number of levels of cache, and then you'd have something like RAM, and then you'd have something like disk, right? Um, and each of these uh, memory um, technologies, right, that we're going through, um, is more expensive typically, uh, but also faster, right? So the fastest operations you can perform are in your registers, which are actually built into the CPU uh, circuitry, right? The next would be um, cache, 
um, and then RAM and then disk, right? So you've probably heard before um, that you want to limit memory accesses or something like that. That's because we store things in a cache when we access them from memory. If we had really simple programs like this Go program that we just wrote, although Go has a whole runtime, which is why we're, we're getting all this information, um, then you can actually do everything in registers. So let's actually take a look at maybe if I believe in one of these. Um, let's try this one. Uh, we have a, a fairly simple program here. Um, and we go ahead and break it down. And uh, here we're mostly using uh, registers, but we do have to eventually go on to the stack, right? So a stack is basically uh, a, a portion of memory that we use to store things when we run out of room in our registers, right? Because remember that we only have a, a limited set, 32 registers here to be able to utilize. Um, and so you'll you'll see things referred to as like the stack or the heap. This basically ways to take advantage of memory. Uh, but what we want to do is limit accesses uh, to memory um, because those are more expensive, right? The, the registers are the cheapest to access, but the most expensive to implement. Um, cache is, is you know, the next level and then RAM and then disk. So we want to limit the amount of those more costly, um, costly in terms of performance uh, accesses to memory. Um, and so, you know, when you, uh, when you do things like in Go, you try to reduce the amount of allocations you make. Uh, that's because we have to access, right, more memory or um, specifically you have to request more memory, right, from the operating system, which has some overhead to it. Um, and so when we actually need to uh, separate memory, right, for, for different processes, right, if you have multiple processes running on your computer, which you probably do right now while you're watching this, um, you need some isolation mechanisms um, to be able to prevent uh, multiple processes for accessing uh, the same memory. And that's something that uh, the operating system manages for you uh, via what's called virtual memory. So when you run a process, it, th it gets a view of memory that makes it look like that it is the only thing running on that computer. Um, and that memory is actually uh, translated into physical memory on the machine. So if we uh, hop over here, maybe we can see a page table diagram or something like that. Yeah, here's a fairly good one, it looks like. If it'll load for us here. Uh, and so basically this is, you can imagine this would be your, your process memory here and you'll see the stack and data and, and text, which would include our instructions. And that's mapped to physical memory. Um, and so when you actually access uh, a memory address um, in your program, right? When it's executing in user space, that's a virtual memory address that the processor then translates to a physical memory address, which then actually, you know, is, is represented on, on physical, um, physical memory. Um, and the reason that we do that is because we can make our limited address space seem a lot bigger by presenting a, a individual address space, a virtual address space to each user space process, um, and then backing that by a potentially slower memory uh, such as disk. So I was actually hoping maybe this one here actually kind of shows it. Yeah. So here we're actually seeing the uh, the physical memory and that some of them are mapped to disk. Um, and so a page table is essentially what allows you uh, to to create this virtual memory abstraction. And if you want to read about um, how that is actually set up, you can go to supervisor address translation and protection. Uh, and this is how uh, we set up things like uh, virtual memory and that sort of thing. Uh, and these are all specified right in the privilege specification because this is configured uh, via supervisor mode here. So uh, I know we only have like 10 minutes left and we uh, have already gone through a number of things, but I did want to kind of like, I feel like when we talk about things below user space, that frequently those seem like they're not very accessible. Um, so I wanted to actually show that we can actually look at things in machine mode and, and that sort of thing uh, before we wrap up here. So 
if I go to this basic uh, privileged example here, I have a pretty uh, simple program here. And essentially what I'm doing is specifying some of these control and status registers that give us information about our, our machine. And I'm reading them into our general purpose registers here. And so um, we're going to run this on QMU, uh, which uh, we're just going to use this simple make file for uh, to build our program um, and then run QMU. And then we'll attach a GDB to it to be able to step through our program. And we'll actually look at how these things are, are manifested, right? Uh, these these uh, control and status registers and how actual attributes um, of the uh, hardware are manifested. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. Let's go ahead and go into our uh, privileged here. I'm going to do make build, which is going to uh, just build our assembly uh, file there and emit uh, this boot.elf. And then I'll do make run. Going to run uh, QMU uh, for the RISC uh, five uh, sixty four bit architecture. Um, also, another thing I wanted to point out is that when we're compiling, we're actually specifying that we're using that RV sixty four GC that I talked about earlier, which means that we have all of these extensions enabled. Which means the compiler, when it's deciding how to take uh, higher level instructions, which it's not really doing here because uh, we're actually specifying the instructions directly. But if you were writing, you know, a higher level program like this, specifying the extensions that are able enabled during co uh, compilation means that the compiler can select right what things are going to be available to it on that architecture. All right. Um, so now that we have this running, uh, we need to attach GDB to it. So I'll go ahead and do that. And let me make this a little bit bigger so folks can see. I'm going to use uh, our RISC-V toolchain here. And I'm going to go ahead and specify uh, the file. Um, but uh, since we are running on my machine, we're actually going to have to attach to QMU uh, to be able to emulate that while we step through it. And to do that, um, you'll actually see here that I specified uh, these uh, flags here that are basically saying uh, wait for uh, the debugger to attach um, to it. Um, and by default, uh, if you're running in this GDB server mode with QMU, you're going to run on port 1234. So if you're in GDB and you want to connect to an emulated um, program here, we can say target, and then it's a remote, and we can just specify the port. And you'll see that we're now connected to QMU, um, and we can step through it. And because we specified our, uh, our binary here, when we started up, we also have the symbols. So if you wanted to, for instance, say, um, show me what's at the start symbol here, we can do disassemble start. And you'll see that it shows us right what's there. And it actually shows us the addresses of these instructions um, in memory. Now, if uh, we wanted to take a look, uh, let's say, at where our program counter is, right? Which points to where our our uh, instruction, what instruction we're, we're currently executing. We can examine it. And here you'll see this does not really look like uh, what we specified in start, right? Well, there is a bit of startup that happens uh, before you jump to whatever you specify um, as, as the um, initial program. And if you're using QMU, uh, it uses, uh, the uh, this address here as the origin. So we loaded our program there, which basically means QMU is going to start up and then jump to whatever is at this address that we specified uh, in our linker script here. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, step through a few of these instructions here until we get to start. All right, so we're at start. Um, and you'll see that we're at the first instruction that we specified. Uh, which is doing a uh, control and status register read of the M heart ID CSR into our a general purpose T0 register. You can look at your registers um, in GDB by doing inspect register or IR here. Um, and so we can see all of our general purpose uh, registers here, uh, as well as uh, our program counter, which you'll see our program counter is at that address now. Uh, also, if you want to see all of the CSR, 
uh, which are the control and status registers, you can do IR all, and it will show you all of these different registers that are used to actually configure the hardware itself. You can go through um, all of those. Um, but I specifically want to look at um, T0, right? Because we are um, loading our heart ID into it. So a, a given uh, machine may have multiple hearts and a heart stands for hardware thread. Um, and that's basically what you'd uh, hear referred to frequently in other architectures as a core, right? So if you have like a multi-core machine, uh, these are individual execution units in your hardware. Um, and we're actually just running with a single core here, or a single heart, um, which we specified with the CPU flag to QMU. So since we're running with a single um, heart, uh, we should actually, we can actually see in GDB, um, I think, yeah, current thread is one. So we only have uh, one uh, thread here. Let's see, I think you can inspect, yeah. So you can see that we're running with one CPU. If we had specified more, we'd be able to see those and switch between them, which would all be executing right at their own uh, kind of pace there. Um, but when we read this M heart ID, which is our, our current instruction, which once again, we can examine uh, where we're at. Program counter. So right, we're reading M heart ID into T0. We should be able to get the ID of our heart, which should be zero, right? Because we only have one thread here. So uh, I'll step through that. And then let's go ahead and look at T0. And you'll know before it was that address that we jumped to, and now it's set to zero. So this is what a control and status register, in this case, it's giving us a status, right, is telling us about the hardware. Um, and so specifically, uh, we read the, uh, let's see if we can find mhart ID here. So hardware thread ID. Um, and so that's what we read there. And you can see the specification for it here. Another interesting one to look at is our uh, MISA register. And find here. Let's see if I can jump to it. Um, yeah, MISA, which it here is going to tell us uh, the extensions that are actually enabled for this hardware. Uh, and we're reading that into T1. So I want to show how we can actually take the contents of one of these registers and understand what's in it, right, um, based on the specification. So I'm going to step into this. And if we look at T1 now, the contents of MISA should be in it. Um, and we have this hexadecimal value. So I'm actually just going to take this. And let's go into a hex to binary converter. And we get this binary out, right? And specified in uh, in the uh, privilege specification here, we'll see that uh, the 26 rightmost bits of this register are going to specify the extensions that are enabled uh, for this hardware. So when you can act, when you actually start up um, on a given RISC V machine, you can uh, understand exactly what it supports in terms of uh, instructions, right? We were looking at these earlier. Um, we are on a uh, RV64 GC one, so we should see that all of those that we specified earlier are enabled. So for instance, uh, in bit zero, we're specifying whether the atomic extension is enabled, and we'll see that it is enabled. And if we look at um, B, uh, would be for bit manipulation, uh, is not enabled, but then uh, compressed should be enabled. So we should see uh, 101. So let me hop back over, right? And so we see bit manipulation not enabled. Um, and then uh, after that, we do see that compressed instructions are enabled. So anyway, uh, this is very simple, right? But we're in machine mode. And you know, if we do another stream on this, uh, we can show about actually jumping to supervisor mode and then starting up uh, a, a operating system and then how that schedules processes and that sort of thing. But hopefully this demystified a little bit while, you know, giving a lot of content. I know we went through a lot here, um, but hopefully this made it a little less opaque. Uh, and also, I'd encourage folks, uh, if you're interested in this, you're more than welcome to ping me. Uh, and I'm happy to go through this in, in more depth with anyone.
Yeah, uh, I think um, we went through a lot and a lot of stuff. Uh, in the end, actually, uh, you know, it, it was kind of difficult to keep up the pace with you. Uh, so, <laughs> but but yeah, uh, it it was really like if you see one of the one of the comments as well, like explained a lot better than any professor. So I think uh, that shows like how much uh, you know uh, how much well you have explained the concepts in detail, which is which is absolutely perfect. Uh, so what do you think? Like uh, coming to yes, this question, like uh you know not i would not say like uh you know a detailed roadmap but what do you say for a beginner uh you know from where they start and where they can go yeah absolutely um well first thing i'd say is uh you know uh ask questions right uh i i was definitely really intimidated by hardware stuff uh and, and honestly like as you've probably seen here like i don't i don't understand all of it by any means i do spend a lot of time reading these specifications because for some reason i think that's fun but um i didn't i don't have formal training in this i do i was very privileged to get a great computer science education in university um so i definitely don't want to discount that um that is you know it's something that's not accessible to everyone but the thing that really excites me about risk five um, you know, hardware has been around for a while and, and I didn't get involved with it until I came upon risk five is that there are implementations that you can look at and you can, uh, learn from, you can ask questions. Right. And, and another thing is this is all happening on GitHub, which is technically, which is usually not, uh, where hardware development is happening. Right. Um, it, or even operating system development, really like a lot of folks I know see, uh, the, uh, Linux kernel, like patch process, right. is confusing and opaque. Um, and, and this is really moving towards opening that up. And um, so I'd say, you know, just be willing to ask questions, be willing to reach out to someone like me. I, I, I love talking about this. Um, I want to, you know, produce more content. I, if I could spend more time working on it, I would. Um, but uh, be willing to ask questions, be willing to experiment, be willing to, you know, uh, compile the, the Linux kernel for RISC V, be willing to get the tool chain and that sort of thing. And if you get stuck, uh, ask for help. Awesome. Uh, so like, you know, uh, people have loved, um, you know, all, all the information that you have provided in today's session. Uh, so I really liked, uh, I also like learned a lot of new things because the risk five uh, is something which is completely new to me as well. I haven't explored that domain to be honest, but I'm willing to, and that is why I, uh, had the stream in the first place. And, uh, you know, someone in your circle, when, when they are doing something with this, then who better to reach out especially dan uh the way he explains is is pretty dope and make sure you attend the session day after tomorrow as well because that will be like a deep dive into cross plane composition a very very cool feature uh and you know um that that will be very interesting uh trust me because it is it it is a cool feature of cross plane and going deep dive into it will open many opportunities uh, of the use cases that you want uh, uh you know you must have been thinking like how you can use in so and so way so that that would be very really interesting uh so thank you dan uh so much for your time uh, make sure you follow uh follow dan on twitter you can see the twitter handle on the screen follow right away because you don't want to miss any of the content in cloud native and risk five that he's producing uh it's it's extra dope uh so you should definitely check that out and thank you so much for tuning in people uh, i know you have you know kind of learned a lot do share your learnings on twitter tag dan you know how uh, how well you understood risk five uh you know uh so so tag risk five as well so that they know you know people people are willing to learn people are people want to get involved on the on the on the low level side of things how how they're working and uh, contribute more i think uh, the more open things have become the more open contributions have become so now is the right time uh, to get involved uh, make your contributions uh, like dan said it's it's a sibling you know uh, to the cncf so you can see the number of contributions over there similarly you can do the number of contributions over here as well see kubernetes was new people had to start learning and had to produce content and then learn similarly it is like risk five you have to start learning you, uh, they, they, there'll be more and more content and then then you keep going you keep contributing so i would say like now is the right time to take an edge and you know uh, go one step before everyone does and get involved in the community uh, because it's it all falls on the Linux Foundation umbrella, which is super cool. Uh, and you have people like Dan uh, who who on, who can answer a pretty reachable 
and uh, yeah i really liked it uh, we we can plan some more sessions as well definitely just uh, your feedback is very important so let us know what you learned what you did and then we'll uh, we'll know okay uh, thank you dan uh, bye uh, bye everyone uh, have a nice day thanks sam see you bye